So we've started it? Okay. Are there any questions?
when I derived the, um, or maybe it was the time before that, when I derived the formula for the Feynman propagator, starting with the four-dimensional form, we got something that kind of looked like this. It was a theta function, an e to the i kx. We didn't have any of this because it was a scalar field, but we had a 1 over k0. And what that means is that we can reverse engineer this expression, and then we get that this same thing is equal to minus i integral d fourth k over 2 pi to the fourth. Uh, the same PAB of k, but now over k squared minus i epsilon e to the i k x minus y. Okay, let's look at the whole thing. So in other words, what we did when we were talking about the scalar propagator is we just have a one here. And we did the, the integral over k zero as a contour integral and got expressions like this with um, PAB over one. And so now I'm just saying that if you um, just reverse engineer that calculation, you see you can write the propagator, the photon propagator, this thing is called the photon propagator, in the Coulomb gauge in this way, where this PAB is this funny thing that is zero when there's a time component, and when it's spatial, it's like this. I'm a little worried that there are some there aren't any questions. Now, the next thing is is is, is this is a trick that I've only seen in Weinberg. I don't know who else does it, but here's what he does. He writes this as a to a b, where a to a b of course is the metric flat space metric, flat space time metric. And then you write it this way, k0, ka a to b plus k0, k b a to a minus k a k b plus k squared a to a, no, n a, this is n. All right, I've, I've screwed up. This is an n. So this is not the greatest notation. So this is an n. n a n b. And big denominator here, 3 vector k squared. So what we're doing is we're writing this PA, which is this nice projection operator that we could have written as I minus K hat, K hat transpose. Um, we're writing it in this funny way. And what is N? N is a time-like vector, 1, 0, 0, 0. So that's what N upper A is. N lower A is minus 1. Zero, zero, zero. And if you plug in, you see that everything works out. Um, I don't know, you, you want me to? I don't, yes, I don't think it's obvious that, that this identity is correct, but um, I assert that it is, and if you want, I'll verify part of it. Yeah? Is, this might be just be me being overly pedantic, but is one of those uh, like column vector? Which? What are we talking about? The ends, isn't it? The n is a, n is a, um, n is a four vector. So, what this means is, for example, if a and B are both spatial, this term is zero. Because N has no spatial term. 
this term is zero, this term is zero, this term is there. Okay, for, so for the spatial case, this is delta AB. In fact, I might as well derive the damn thing. If A and B are both spatial, this is simply delta AB minus KA, KB over 3 vector K squared for AB equal to 1, 2, 3. Okay? Because N1, N2, N3 are 0, so all these terms vanish. Yeah. On the other hand, if, say, they're both 0, or I might as well do it, if they're both 0, then what we get is A to AB minus 1 um, plus, all right, now let's see, K0, this is a minus 1 minus K lower 0, right? This one is K0, K0, again, minus 1. This one is minus K0 squared, since I can, I can, there are just two minus signs here. And this one is plus K squared. And then we have K vector squared. Now, I hope this works out. We want to get what? We want to get zero. So, um, what we've got here is if we raise this zero, we cancel the plus. So, this is like that. Similarly, this one looks like that. And then we have minus k0 squared, and then plus k squared. This k squared is k vector squared minus k0 squared. So this thing is then k vector squared minus k0 squared. And now we have k0 squared plus k0 squared plus minus k0 squared minus k0 squared. The k0 squares are gone. We have k vector squared over k vector squared. That's 1. We have a minus 1. We get 0. So in fact, the thing works. You might say, why are we doing this? This looks perverse. And in fact, Weinberg says it's perverse. Um, but k squared here is k vector squared minus k0 squared. And you might say, well, what is k0 in this case? Because this thing is a function of 3 vector k. That's where it came from. It really is just PAB of 3 vector k delta AB minus KAKB over 3 vector k squared. And otherwise, it's 0. Question. Well, oh, no, no, let me just finish this, the paragraph. K0 here in this expression is arbitrary. It doesn't have to be square root of m squared. Well, it doesn't have to be length of k, 3 vector k. So K0 here is arbitrary. And why do we want it to be arbitrary? Because we want to make contact with this where we're integrating over all K0. K0 here is not 3 vector k. And the way you tell whether or not K0 is omega k square root of k squared plus m squared is whether you're integrating over four variables or three variables. If you're integrating over three variables, it's almost always square root of k squared plus m squared. If you're integrating over four variables, well, it can't be that because yeah, you're, it's, a, it's a dummy variable. All right, your, your question. Oh, yes, you can find an A. Is NB the same? Is NB equal to NA? Is NB the same as NB? Oh, A, B are, are indices that go from 0 to 3. Right, but the NA is simply defined as a 4 vector. 
for the oh well, the well, well here n is one flow vector with an upper index it's one zero 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 with a lower index yes. it's minus one zero 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 and so, so this a, is the, just this is just the a component of n and this is just the b component of n but in both cases lowered so that um, there's a minus sign on the on the on the time component. Okay. All right. Good question. All right. Now the point of this is that in perturbation theory and in momentum space, is is this sum too much on you? Oh. Okay, now, how does this thing occur? Well, it occurs in this way. That is to say, J here is a conserved current, and what does that mean? That means that dA, JA of x is zero. And we, 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 in, in three vector language, this is rho dot plus divergence of J equals zero. And in fact, if you integrate that over a small volume, then you get that the integral of rho dot d cubed x is equal to minus the integral of del dot j d cubed x, and this is equal to minus j dot d surface set over the surface. And so the total charge inside changes with time at a rate that's given by in other words, it's increasing at minus the rate at which it's flowing out. Okay, so that's the idea of a conserved current. So we want dJ, dA, JA equals zero. And in momentum space, that's KA, JA, JA of K equals zero. And so what I'm saying to you is if we were doing perturbation theory, with this uh, photon propagator, we could write the photon propagator in this crazy form, but it would only occur between conserved currents in momentum space. And what would that mean? Well, that would mean that you have JA of K, big bracket, A to AB, plus K0, KA, NB, plus K0, KB, NA, minus KA, KB, plus K squared, NA, NB, all that over K vector squared, times JB. Okay, and now let me erase some of this because I need more space. All right, now since we've got this relation with JA, KA equals zero, You see, what happens is you get the first term with JA, and let me, or JA of K, you're going to get A to AB in the first term. But this term is going to be zero because it's JA, KA. This term is zero because it's KB, JB. This term vanishes because it's for two reasons, JA, KA, and KB, JB. And so all we get is plus, uh, is plus k vector squared na nb over k squared j 
JB of K. And so this is once again JA1, it's just JA, JA. And then this term. Do you need the k's in there as well? Excuse me? Oh, no, never mind. Never mind. I got it. Sorry. All right. You still get a chocolate, although I don't know that it's your set. I'll take it, but. All right. So what does this give us? This gives us minus JA, minus J0 uh, from this one, and then a minus J0 from the other one. So that's plus J0 squared, K squared over K vector squared. So that's what it turns into. So in other words, when you have something like j a of x and then a minus i delta a b of x minus y, j b of y, this thing in momentum space turns into it's effectively Um, it's effectively the a to a b term, and so this is like minus i integral d fourth k over two pi to the fourth, and the first term then is j a of k. Let me just do it this way: a to a b. J of k over k squared minus i epsilon. And of course then there's an e to the i k x minus y. But let me put it in this term. The next term is uh, plus j0 of k squared. Now this k squared cancels that k squared. And so we've got 1 over k vector squared. And then we have e to the i k x minus y. OK? And now what happens? The dk0 turns into a delta function of k0 of x0 minus y0. And you have left a d cubed k over 2 pi cubed. That just gives you the Coulomb term. So in other words, what, this give, what, the, what you get here is minus i d fourth k over 2 pi to the fourth j a of k a to a b over k squared minus i epsilon j b of k e to the i k x minus y, and then the other term is effectively minus a half integral d cubed x, d cubed y, I'm going back into position space, j0 of t and x, j0 of t and y, over 4 pi x minus y vector. So in other words, what you wind up with when you put the Coulomb gauge photon propagator in between conserved currents is you wind up with this very nice expression for an effective photon propagator plus this Coulomb term. And this Coulomb term just cancels the other Coulomb term that we had. So the, the, net, the net result is that when one does perturbation theory, one can um, use this expression for the Feynman propagator and forget about the Coulomb term. And so this is this this means that we go go to a relativistically invariant formulation, and we don't have this uh, this, this awkward Coulomb term. 
This is what we found more simply and, and actually probably more rigorously when we were doing the path integral because um, we got to an equation which I'll, I'll write down the number of it 16.177 which was um, in, in, in which I said that if you repeated for the case of alpha equal to 1, which is the Feynman gauge, if you repeat it for that case, the um, derivation that we did do for the, in the path integral formulation of the scalar propagator and the, and the C number current, that we get, um, we get uh, a photon propagator that um, look like that. So in other words, the effective photon propagator is in, in both cases, it's equal to minus I delta, we might say effective AB at X minus Y, which is, and let me get the right sign. Yeah, we've got a minus i here. A to a b. Oh boy, there's a typo. E to the i k x minus y. K squared minus i epsilon e fourth k over two pi to the fourth. Okay. So that's um, what we have. Can I use your pen just for a second? All right, now, there are two things that I have to admit here. First of all, I've been going a little bit fast. And secondly, the argument in any case is something of a hand wave. But when we did it in, in terms of the path integral, it wasn't a hand wave, although it might have been more mysterious. And anyway, the bottom line is, when you do perturbation theory in electrodynamics, you can use this very nice propagator and for the photons. Now, I, I think what I'm going to do on Monday is I'm going to go back to the path integral and um, do the computation that would take us to this expression. Um, it's, it's really just uh, some some dog work, but there are so many minus signs that I think if I try to do it in class, I'll screw up. So I'm going to leave that till Monday, and now I'm going to shift to some to a, to a totally different topic because we're going to have to bring in um, fermions pretty soon because after all, electrons are fermions, and um, so are quarks and so are muons and neutrinos and so forth. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some notes on group theory online on the web page. And um, I'm also going to say some things now about Lie algebra. Now, how many have had a course on group theory? Is that a yes for you? OK. So a couple have. And when you had group theory, did they? Did they emphasize the algebra or did they emphasize the group theory? Well, the group theory, rings, fields, group theory, Galois fields, Galois theory. And, yeah. Which? Same in our Same as it? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, the, the, there are sort of two kinds of group theory. There's the math group theory and then there's the physics group theory. The math group theory is what you guys just described. And um, it can be very, very difficult because um, you can be talking about a group manifold, which is, can be sort of a um, something in higher dimensions, and you can use all sorts of differential geometry, and it, it can get very complicated. On the other hand, the physics point of view is to, first of all, think about representations of the group and then look at the representations of the group near the identity 
or near the matrix that represents the identity, and of course that's just the unit matrix. So the, so the physics group theory is really, really, really so much simpler. Um, and it's kind of a pity that That this, most, most books on group theory are unfortunately emphasized the mathematical, the mathematician's approach. And um, uh, I don't want to say that way lies madness, but it's, a, it's, it's almost true. All right, so first of all, if you have a group, you might have, say, G, A, uh, let's see, A is bad. Let us say G alpha, G beta is some G alpha beta. So that's the, the law of multiplication for a group. And I, in fact, I might say something about a group. What, what, is, what, what do you need to have? What is a group? It's, first of all, a set of elements. G1, G2, and so forth. And the idea is that, uh, that uh, G alpha, G beta is in the group. If G alpha is in the group, G beta is in the group, then the product is in the group. Moreover, um, the thing is associative. So G alpha, G beta times G gamma is equal to G alpha times G beta, G gamma, and um, there's an identity. E is in the group such that G E, which is E G, is G, and every G in G has an inverse, G inverse, such that G inverse G is G, G inverse is the identity. And what is G, sorry? Is there, was there a question? What is G? What is little g or big G? Little g or big G? Little g is an element of a group big G. So and it's defining what a group is. So like an element like? Like in a set. Okay. Basically a group is a special type of set. Right. G is a set. G is a set. Self. Say G1, G2. And um, a multiplication rule. And the multiplication rule is such that the product of any two elements in the group, the product of any two group elements is in the group. The thing is associative. So this is called closure. This is called associativity. This is called the identity. And this is called the inverse. And so it's, it's just this simple uh, structure here. And now, if you take a bunch of matrices, you can, um, if the matrices are non-singular, then you're always going to have each matrix. You, you, you need to make sure that the inverse of each matrix is in your set. And then if it is, the product of the inverse times the matrix gives you the identity, which is just the unit matrix. Matrix multiplication is automatically associative. So the hard thing is closure. In other words, if you multiply any two matrices, do you get another matrix in the set? Now, um, so that's the thing that's, that's, that, that is the sticking point. It turns out that physics, we, we talk about transformations. Transformations on things like rotations, Lorentz transformations, translations, uh, and all of these things naturally form a group. The reason is that if you have, uh, and, and let me say uh, something about these transformations that we talk about in physics. They're normally not arbitrary transformations, they're transformations that leave something invariant. And so if the, trans if, 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 the, if the first transformation leaves 
something invariant, and the second one leaves something invariant, and we define product of two transformations as the first transformation and then the second transformation acting on, the, on whatever it is we're talking about, if the first one leaves an invariant and the second one does also, then the first one, in other words, we have, let's call S the thing that's left invariant. So T1 on S is S. Then T2, T1 on S will be T2 on S, which will be, again, S. So if, if T1 and T2 both leave S invariant, then the product will leave S, whatever it is, invariant. And moreover, if T1 does this, then if that's a transformation, then you can imagine, in other words, if it's, say, the trans, the group element is, T1 is that, well, obviously, T1 inverse exists, you just move it backwards. And the identity is just the null transformation where you don't do anything to S. So a set of physical transformations naturally forms a group. That's why group theory is relevant to physics. Is there any question? Okay. Anyway, these notes will be online. All right, now, um, so, a, a representation of a group is um, a set of matrices such that D of G alpha times D of G beta is D of G alpha beta. In other words, with G alpha we associate a matrix G, D of G alpha, with D, G beta we associate a matrix D of G beta, and it's a representation if the product rule of the group is respected by the product rule of the matrices. Okay. I see some. You're frowning. Why are you frowning? Um, could you do like a little bit more of like an introduction as to what What, what? As to what we're doing here, I feel like I'm a little lost. Okay. Because we kind of like just jumped right in and... I did. Can we, can we take a step back? Yes. And we can our, get our feet wet first. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, a group is an, an abstract mathematical concept. And it's a set of elements that obey four rules. What are the four rules? The first rule is closure, that if you have any two group elements, the product, first of all, you have a group is a set of elements that are in the group, and then a multiplication wall. Uh, I think you just may have answered my question. So part of the group is some sort of multiplication law for multiplying the elements of the group. That's, that's part of the definition of the group? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Because I was wondering how you know how to multiply the elements necessarily. But. Great. Right. So a group is a set of elements and a multiplication law, or a multiplication table. In fact, if you have a finite group, it's a table. G1 times G2 is G3. G3 times G1 is G2, or whatever. Okay. But in general, this multiplication rule has to satisfy, and the elements of the group has to satisfy, have to satisfy four rules. The most important one is closure, that the product of any two group elements is another element in the group. So in other words, this is equal to G alpha beta, which is in the group. Then there's associativity, that G alpha times G beta times G gamma. In fact, I, I lapsed into using group, group Greek elements because um, I had previously used AB for four vector indices. It, it, 
probably true that we could remove some of the frowns if we just went to Roman indices, because I think that this using Greek indices just spooks people unless they're Greek. Um, is associative, namely GAGB times GC is the same as GA times GBGC. There's an identity element that doesn't do anything. And then every element in the group has an inverse, such that G times G inverse is the identity. And this thing we're going to write as, as that. The mathematicians write it as that. Every element in the group must have an inverse. Yes. which is also a member of the group. Yes! <laughs> Sorry. So, so what's your question? So can we subtract or add up to elements in your group? Ah! No! And um, not in general. Okay. A group just has one operation in general. Mm -hmm. Which could be addition. Huh? Which could be addition. You could add another one. And in fact, when you, if you're representing group elements as matrices, obviously you can add matrices. And presumably you could define your, your like multiplication rules to be addition. Oh, yes. You can absolutely... When I said that we had one rule called multiplication, it could have been addition. Um, and in fact, there's a whole set of groups called abelian groups that, um, in which addition is a more natural uh, operation. But um, if you have both multiplication and addition, and if you add a couple of natural rules, then what you have is not a group but a field. And this is a, 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 a more, much more restrictive uh, mathematical uh, object. So the complex numbers are a field. The real numbers are a field. All right, now, all right, example, I, I should give you some examples of groups then. I hadn't realized that um, it would be necessary to, So for example, you have uh, rotations. So first of all, you can have an axis. And you can have rotations about that axis. And if you do one rotation, what, is the, what does the rotation do? It leaves the axis invariant. So there you have transformations that leave a certain axis invariant um, form a group. But in fact, um, more generally, if you don't consider rotations that leave a certain axis invariant, what rotations really do is that they're, they're, they're transformations that, in fact, um, well, let, let me make something even simpler. Translations in, say, three-dimensional space are things that leave the difference between any two points invariant. Um, rotations leave the um, distance of any point from the origin invariant. So in other words, it's x squared that's invariant, the distance from the origin. And you can rotate about any axis. And if if, if, you leave, if one rotation leaves x squared or invariant, then the, and the second one does, then clearly the product will. And so rotations in three space about a fixed axis 
a fixed, not axis, a fixed center form a group. And then um, you can have Lorentz transformations. Lorentz transformations leave, uh, let us say, x minus y vector squared minus x0, y0 uh, invariant. And um, you can then have um, things that are Lorentz transformation followed by a translation. That forms what's called the quantitative group. Okay. And um, there's a whole set of, of groups that occur many times in physics. And I, if I just tell you what these are, you'll see that it, that it makes a lot of sense. Um, Un is the group of all n by n unitary matrices. And a unitary matrix then is such that u dagger u is u, u dagger is the identity. So you see you obviously have an inverse. And it's matrix multiplication. Matrix multiplication is automatically associated. And if, so the question is, what about closure? Well, if U1 is unitary, which means U1 inverse is U1 adjoint, and U2 inverse is U2 adjoint, then U1, U2, Inverse, well, we know what that is. We know that that's U2 inverse, U1 inverse. And that means then that this is U2 adjoint, U1 adjoint. But this is the same thing as U1, U2 adjoint. So these U1 and U2 are both n by n matrices. So U1, U2 adjoint is U2 adjoint, U1 adjoint. They're both unitary, so that's U2 inverse, U1 inverse. And then matrix multiplication tells you that that's U1 inverse. So we have that U1, U2 inverse is U1, U2 adjoint. Okay, so that's an example of, that, that's a group called UN. SUN is simply the group of all unitary matrices, n by n unitary matrices of determinant 1. So determinant UN is 1. And because the, the, the product of two determinants so determinant u, u adjoint is determinant of u absolute value squared, or to put it differently, it's determinant u, determinant u star. And so this is determinant of u absolute value squared, but this thing is determinant of the identity matrix because this is the inverse. So this is determinant of u, u inverse, which is determinant of the I, n by n identity matrix. And that's one, so we have determinant u squared is one. So the determinant of uh, an n by n unitary matrix can, must be a unimodular phase factor. It must be EVI theta. We get the group SUN, SUN, S here means effectively special. That means that theta is 0 or 2 pi, so that this thing is 1. So the n by n unitary matrices that have determinant 1, they form the group SUN. And then we have the orthogonal matrices, ON is an orthogonal matrix, and that means that O n, i, j, x, j 
which is x prime i is such that x1 prime squared plus plus x n prime squared is equal to x1 squared plus plus x n squared. So that's that's an orthogonal matrix. An orthogonal matrix is a rotation in n space or a reflection in n space or some combination of reflection and rotation. And that forms a group called ON. And then there's another set of groups called SON. And these are just the orthogonal, the n by n orthogonal matrices that have unit determinants. And um, so these are the groups that are most commonly used in, in well, in elementary particle physics, namely the orthogonal groups, the special orthogonal groups, the unitary groups, and the special unitary groups. SU2, as you know, is from quantum mechanics, is the sort of uh, is the rotation group that we use to spin one half particles, and um, uh, SO3 is the ordinary rotation group. Um, okay, I think I think now it turns out that this. This, well, let me, let me get on to the, the next concept. Um, but if there's any question, I have a whole bag of chocolate. notice are what's, what you can think of them as continuous groups. That is to say, if you have a rotation about a certain axis by a certain angle, you can rotate just a tiny bit more. And so you can continuously vary how much you rotate. Similarly, if you translate, you continuously can vary how much you translate. The Lorentz boosts, you can go from being stationary to going at 20 miles an hour, 55 miles an hour, depending on where the police cars are. And um, okay, so, so these are called continuous groups. And they're also associated with the name Lee. There was a mathematician, Sophus Lee, who studied these uh, and developed many of the techniques. He studied them though in the, in, 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 as a mathematician and the stuff he was talking about was rather hard to understand. So let's say that I'm going to use the following notation. D of A is going to be D of G of A. A of the parameters. So in the case of a rotation, it would be the angle of rotation and the axis about which you're rotating. Um, in the case of a Lorentz boost, it would be the direction of the boost and how much the acceleration would be. Um, but in order to avoid having D of G of A, which is a lot of writing, we can, we can abbreviate that as just D of A. And that's going to be a matrix then, if we have a representation. And the, the important thing then, or the, the insight that I guess, I guess it was made by Lee himself, was that if you use parameters that are very small and are talking about elements really near the identity, then we can write them as I times the sum of TA 
dA. And I'm, 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 let's see, dA, well, I'm, I'm using sort of a, a double notation here. All right, let's do this. So A is a set of parameters, dA is the set of parameters that are very small, and so the, so D of zero is just the identity matrix. You think of it, say, as an n by n matrix. And now any matrix near it is going to be the identity plus some D, A, K, T, K, I summed. Okay. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to introduce a summation convention. Well, I'm going to write this as I plus or oh, the, the identity matrix plus TK DAK. So I'm just summing over K. And uh, if we're talking about rotations, we sum over three uh, um, values of K. If the rotation is about a fixed axis, then there would just be one generator. All right, now. I have a question. For a question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you said this already, but uh, it, T, TK are matrices, matrices in the set, or very the good. That was definition? a brilliant question. I forgot to say. Yes, since this is a matrix, this is a matrix. These are parameters, just real numbers. Then these guys have to be matrices. They're n by n matrices, and they're in the group. Then ah, no, 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 no. What's in the group? is this group element, mm -hmm. or if you want, you can say the D of A is in the group, because your group can be the group, for example, SON is the group of n by n matrices that are orthogonal and have determinant 1. But that's a different group. Huh? That's a different, they're members of some other group that's like a representation of the group that G's in. Is that right? D, A, and D. There, there, yeah, yeah, I mean, here we're, the language is a little bit precious because it's mathematics. So, yeah, but, but yeah, it, it was good that you brought this up. Suppose the group is, let us say, SON. Then the Gs are in this group SON. These matrices could be n by n orthogonal matrices of determinant 1, and then the d's would be the same as the g's. But you can have different size matrices that also obey the multiplication rule. So for example, for example, we have the rotations. So the group is SO3. Um, or in fact, let me, let me use the quantum mechanical lingo. Suppose the group is SU2. Then this, these are unitary matrices that are two by two and have determinant one. And this is what we use for spin one half objects. In fact, we can write down what those are. They are e to the i theta dot sigma over 2, the 2 is conventional, this is a vector, that's a vector, theta is real, and the sigmas are the Pauli matrices. Sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 So those are the three power matrices. You exponentiate them, you get the group SU2. This, we say, is the defining representation of SU2. Now, you can have, however, as you learned in quantum mechanics, you can, in other words, in SU2, what do you have? You have G. A times GB equals GC. That's the multiplication law. Okay. 
Now, you can have matrices D of GA that are N by N. D of GB equals D of GC. These now are N by N matrices. Whereas the original group was two by two complex matrices. These are N by N matrices. And what are these matrices? Well, these matrices, the, the, the ones that are interesting at least, are you have J equal to 0, 1 half, 1, 3 halves, etc. Or in other words, um, J is, say, N over 2, where N is an integer, non-negative integer. And these matrices then are 2J plus 1 by 2j plus 1 dimensional matrices. So they're 2j plus 1 squared. So for example, for j equals um, 1 half, they're 2 by 2. That was spin 1 half. And so that's these guys, 2 by 2. For j equals 1, they're 2 plus 1, 3 by 3. Those are the ordinary rotations in space. For a spin 3 half object, 2 times 3 half is 3. They're 4 by 4 matrices. For a spin 2 object like the graviton, they're 2 times 2 plus 1, 5 by 5 dimensional matrices. And in general, for a spin j object, it's 2j plus 1 times 2j plus 1 dimensional matrices. And I was saying that any matrices that do this, we say, are a form of representation. The kinds of representations we're interested in, mostly in physics, are unitary matrices. So the D of A times, let us say, D of, or adjoint of A will be the identity. In other words, there, there are matrices that are also unitary. And it, it turns out um, which, which, which sorts of groups have finite dimensional unitary matrices uh, can be represented by finite dimensional unitary matrices. These are the compact groups. The compact groups are the rotation groups, the unitary groups. Um, and now you say, well, which ones don't have finite dimensional uh, uh, unitary representations? These are the non-compact groups, and such as the translations or the Lorentz transformations. And um, these are characterized by parameter spaces that are infinite, and or the effect of the transformation is arbitrarily big. All right, I'm. Yes. Uh, I, I really don't need milk chocolate. <laughs> what? I definitely don't need milk chocolate. You definitely don't need milk chocolate. All right. Uh, Is somebody hungry? <laughs> yes. So you have this original, if when we're dealing with this specific one that you Sorry, your English accent is <laughs> driving me crazy. What is it? <laughs> this specific example that you've given us of SU2 with yes. the e to the i theta. Right. Um, and then you've said that we can have this representation where we have, where we like make this into 3 by 3 matrices or... 2j you know, plus, yeah, or 2j plus, plus 1 by 2j plus 1. Matrices. So they, these matrices, do they all sum, are they like a function of these matrices? Do they, do they all have like a counterpart in the... Uh, right, right, right. Okay, YouTube. good. In other words, this is the defining representation. So for each one of these, there is a D, and I could have written it as D of E to the I theta dot sigma over 2. Yeah. 
So how would you like generate a three by three? Ah, it from turns it? out. It turns out. In fact, we're going to. We're, uh, you, 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 you're, you're getting ahead of me here, but it turns out that this thing actually is e to the i j sub j uh, dot theta. That's what it would be. Where this is a two j plus one by two j plus one dimensional matrix that plays the role of sigma over two. There are three of these and there are three of these. Okay. There'll be a J1, a J2, and a J3. And these are just the angular momentum matrices that you learned about in quantum mechanics. So the J2 is just the standard Pauli matrices. Right, for, for the J's, for the case of this, the, the two by two representations are just the Pauli matrices. Yeah. So can you think of like D as generalizing like any group to a higher dimension? It's just like the operation of doing that? It's, it's just that it... Not a higher dimension, but a higher like well, higher dimension for your Hilbert space or whatever, not higher group dimension. I don't know. I guess there's two kind of dimensions going. Um, what we've got is we've got the group. It has a multiplication law. We have we have then uh, a re a various representations of that group multiplication law. In the case of the of SU2, we have for every integer j, or I should say for every half integer j, we have a representation, we have a set of matrices, in fact it's not a set, it's an infinite uh, set of ma matrices, that obey the multiplication law. So D in other words, if you have e to the i theta 1 dot sigma over 2, e to the i theta 2 dot sigma over 2, is equal to e to the i, and it's going to be theta 3 dot sigma over 2, then there's going to be a j, 2j plus 1 by 2j plus 1 dimensional matrix which we can say is dj of theta 1, and that times dj of theta 2 will be dj of theta 3. So this is what we say is going to be, this is what, this representation obeys that group multiplication law. So it's just like a different representation of the same group. Yes, yes, way. yes. So they have and, to obey the same. D is for the door. German word Darstellung, which is representation. And so what part of D specifies the n, like what dimension, what n is pretty much for that representation? You mean the size of the matrix? Yeah. Well, it's just, I mean, you know, you just... It just depends on the case. I mean, if, if you just have to look around at all the matrices that can possibly exist and find the ones that satisfy this rule. And in the case of the rotation group, it's very simple. Now, it turns out that Cartan worked this out. And there are basically four sets of representations of continuous groups. It's basically the ones I've mentioned plus the symplectic group. And the symplectic group is complicated. I'm not going to go into that. Um, and, but I would advise you, if you want to do theoretical physics and you want to do something amusing, you might want to think about the symplectic group because it's been neglected, because it's complicated. It involves quaternions. It's confusing. And so people um, avoid it. Um, I remember hearing a lecture by some French theoretical physicist who was very mathematical and kind of weird. I shouldn't say this, but I don't think he's still.
so on. Um, anyway, he um, once was giving a lecture on this eclectic group, and he basically started out by saying, "This this isn't easy," and um, but it could be it could be that the symplectic group plays a big role. It does play a role in mechanics. Hamiltonian mechanics has a symplectic structure, um, but never mind the symplectic thing. Oh. Let me just define what these things are. These T's. These are called the generators of the Lie algebra. And so let me just tell you how you get the T's. It's obvious what they are. In other words, what are the T's? Well, TA, well, I might as well use the notation that I was, all right. If it, T sub A, let me, let me go back to the, the Greek here. Call this alpha, G of alpha, and this will be D alpha sub A, and that will be T A. Okay, and this will be D alpha. Then T A is simply minus I the partial derivative with respect to alpha a of d of alpha at alpha equals zero. So that's what the generators are. In other words, we have a set of parameters, might be n parameters. We'll use a as an index for the parameters. They label the group element d of g of alpha, where alpha is a set of parameters equals a matrix, which we're going to call D of alpha. And then if we take the partial derivative of D of alpha with respect to the eighth alpha, multiplied by minus i, set alpha equal to zero, that's the generator T A. All right. So we'll pick up next time uh, at this point. These notes I'll put online. I would, um, I would just sort of warn you, though, I mean, unless you really want to learn all about group theory, there's no need for this course to read the whole notes. I would say just read the beginning, which says what a group is, give some examples of groups, and then go to the section that I'm doing now, which is section um, 15. So go to section 1015 which is a section on Leon. Right. Can I ask you a quick question about the homework? Yeah, sure. So, so, uh, so did you turn it off?